Welcome everybody to our TIFF talk. I'm Andrea Millers with Endogastric Solutions. And today I'm very uh, happy to announce that we have Dr. Phoenix Nguyen with us uh, and also Dr. Pearlstein. In addition to that, we have a patient of theirs, uh, John Callisto. So thank you again all for being here tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. So uh, Dr. Phoenix Nguyen, uh, she is the medical director of Hogue Advanced Endoscopy Center in Newport Beach, California. Welcome. We also have Dr. Uh, Daryl Pearlstein. He is the head of thoracic surgery at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach as well. And then John Callisto is uh, in Carlsbad, correct? California, is that right? Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, welcome again, and thank you for being here today. We are going to um, talk a little bit about GERD, um, and uh, first we're going to go ahead and let Dr. Nguyen um, kind of go through a little bit about uh, what GERD is. So Dr. Nguyen, take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's actually a very common condition, and it affects a quarter of the American population. And uh, about a quarter of those patients who have GERD actually take an anti-acid medication on a daily basis. Um, and only a fraction of those patients visit a doctor when, especially when they have refractory symptoms. Uh, now we know a lot about um, some safety concerns related to long-term use of anti-acid medications. There are many uh, purported potential side effects in addition to the cost and the, the pain of having to remember to take your medications daily. Um, so why do we um, care uh, if we are able to take a medication? And what's uh, really alarming is that we see a significant rising trend over the past three decades of esophageal cancer incidents. And the studies suggest that the severity of the GERD is associated with increased risk of esophageal cancer and perhaps a lack of awareness and a lack of screening for disease may also be contributors. Uh, to the right of the screen, you'll see that um, esophageal cancer has an aggressive pattern with high mortality that parallels the incidence of disease. We, uh, we see that uh, GERD is um, fairly complex in its uh, symptom uh, complex. Uh, and when we eat, what happens is the food will be uh, masticated and it'll pass into the esophagus and then uh, get to the junction of the esophagus and stomach, passes into the stomach. Um, uh, you can have typical symptoms of GERD or atypical symptoms, and um, it is uh, defined as the abnormally frequent reflux of stomach contents uh, back up into the esophagus. And um, patients can have some of these symptoms or they can have all of these symptoms. They can have typical and atypical symptoms. And the typical symptoms include uh, heartburn, chest pain, regurgitation. Some of the atypical symptoms that we don't know a lot about or hear a lot about is a cough and hoarseness, um, the excessive clearing of the throat. Um, and dental uh, conditions, including erosions and gum disease. When the uh, food passes from our mouth, um, there's saliva that is integrated with the food bolus, and then the esophagus functions to move the food bolus uh, through. Um, so that's what you see on the left, uh, that pump, which is what the esophagus will do. And at the, at the bottom of the esophagus, there's a sphincter, uh, muscle that has a certain length, a uh, certain pressure, and that pressure is decreased when the food passes. And then into the stomach, uh, the stomach produces secretions. It can dilate to hold the stomach, uh, the food that passes into the stomach. And then stomach has emptying functions, and all this aids in digestion um, of food. 
And GERD occurs as a result of dysfunction of this normal process that I just described. And when a patient um, is seen, we really need to assess or study all the different components um, of this digestion uh, to give a very comprehensive diagnosis and determine what kind of therapy. Um, so when a patient uh, presents to a physician for evaluation, um, the, these are some of the diagnostic tests that we perform. The endoscopy is done to look for complications of GERD. And um, it's usually about a five, 10 minute procedure. Patient's asleep. We look inside with a uh, flexible tube and it evaluates for complications of GERD to include esophagitis, which is inflammation of the esophagus, esophageal strictures, ulceration, and a condition called Barrett's esophagus, which is thought to be pre-cancer. And then we also look for anatomic abnormalities um, in the esophagus. Um, to the left here on the screen, you'll see uh, this tracing of what the esophagus will look like as it moves the food along. And this study is called an esophageal manometry study. And it looks at the function of this pump or the esophagus to rule out different motility disorders that can mimic what GERD would present as. To the right of the screen, you'll see a pH study uh, which documents GERD. And it, this is particularly important when you have a normal looking esophagus at the time of endoscopy. And this pH study is typically done uh, either two days or four days where the patient wears a little monitor and we measure acid in the esophagus to document GERD. Um, at the bottom of the screen, we see an esophagogram, which is where the patient swallows some contrast, and we look at the structural, uh, the structure of the esophagus. This gives us a big picture. It looks uh, also to see, to document a hiatal hernia. So the hernia is part of the stomach back up into the chest above the level of the diaphragm which is one of the key, uh, one of the components uh, that causes um, and is implicated in GERD. Uh, we really think that this is a mechanical issue or a mechanical problem. So when we pinpoint what the problem is, then we can go forward and treat the condition appropriately. So here you're looking at the anatomy um, and normal anatomy to the left of the screen, you'll see um, when the sphincter at the bottom of the esophagus is closed, you really don't have any reflux of um, stomach contents. You can have a little bit, uh, it's infrequent, mild, and that's considered physiologic reflux. Um, and at the bottom left of the screen, you'll see that that uh, sphincter or the valve is closed and it hugs that black uh, structure, which is our endoscope. To the right of the um, slide, you'll see what happens in abnormal anatomy. And here the sphincter just can't close and it can move in its position, um, have a hernia, and the stomach contents can reflux. Um, back up into the esophagus. And at the bottom right, you'll see that the valve doesn't hug that black structure, the scope, and that looseness um, can be associated with frequent and sometimes even intense reflux. So what's our solution? Uh, we want to restore this anatomy to normal, perhaps uh, repair the valve. Um, so when we have um, patients coming in, and sometimes patients come in, they say they've been on anti-acid medications for 20 years, and now it doesn't work anymore. And um, they've just kind of gotten used to it. That's the way life is. And they have GERD. They have heartburn. They have uh, regurgitation, and they've learned to live with it. 
but by the time they come to see a doctor, um, oftentimes they've been on these uh, various anti-ass medications for many years. So um, this repair of the valve we can now do endoscopically. And this endoscopic approach that we're talking about today is called TIF, which is transoral incisionless fund application. So this is offered um, after, you know, we've tried all the lifestyle modifications, avoid pretty much everything that's good in life to include alcohol and tomatoes and citrus foods and so on. And uh, then the patient have taken all the medications to include the um, anti-acid medication, the H2 blockers, which one of it, um, the Zantac was taken off the shelf. And now we hear about um, Pepsid, which is also another H2 blocker uh, and its use in this COVID uh, treatment. Um, and then the PPI, which is the proton pump inhibitor, which is a stronger category of anti-acid medication. Um, the PPIs now um, have, uh, they work, um, but there have been a list of uh, reported side effects with the uh, PPI use. So a little bit about TIF. Um, the TIF device is placed into the stomach and it's positioned um, at the end of the esophagus and at the junction between the esophagus and the stomach. And you can see that on the left of the screen, which is step one. And it's uh, the device is used to rebuild the valve. The endoscope is placed in the center of the device and we can actually see the work that we're doing while we're doing it. And tissue is retracted into the device and it's wrapped and the tissue is secured with fasteners to create that magical valve. And about now, approximately 30 fasteners are placed to form a 270 degree wrap. And the TIF device reconstructs that anti-reflux barrier by creating a three centimeter length valve just below the level of the diaphragm. Again, the diaphragm is what separates the chest and the abdomen. Um, and TIF, I think, has, has been around. It has great success, shown by our studies, with low rates of complication. And a recent, very well-done meta-analysis looking at many, many studies on TIF showed that 90% of the patients were able to completely discontinue PPI use with significant and very durable improvement in their symptoms. Um, and pH studies objectively show that um, there are results and it's improved after the TIF procedure. Um, now, TIF is um, available and offered to patients who have a small hernia, short and not as wide, if the patient has a larger hernia or a wider hernia, then we offer what is called a concomitant hernia repair and TIF. And this is what Dr. Perlstein will cover and into his section. Perfect. So Dr. Daryl Perlstein, you're on. Yes. So let me uh, put your slides up one second. Thank you very much, Dr. Nguyen. Well, that I, can, was I can share my, my thing. Oh, you I mean, can, fantastic. Wonderful. Are you able to see it? Um, yes, we can see your screen. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Can you see me? I can't, you're good. Perfect, well, thanks for having us. Um, on this platform to talk about um, anti-reflux surgery. I know there's a lot of people out there in the country, a lot of people I'm sure are watching who are suffering from reflux disease. Um, uh, I've been uh, doing thoracic surgery for 15 or 16 years. And in the first part of my career, I did a lot of reflux surgery and I kind of got away from it because I thought that the options we had to offer weren't um, 
particularly good. And uh, mostly what I had been doing was lung cancer surgery. And with Dr. Nguyen, I sort of got back into the anti-reflux game uh, because of the TIF procedure, which I, I think is just a terrific uh, addition to our armamentarium in terms of how we can handle um, this disease process and how we can help these patients. And I'd sort of start by saying that the court of public opinion is sort of is, is voting with their feet in terms of anti-reflux surgery. It was it was really built up. A lot of people were getting anti-reflux surgery in the 1990s, and then it peaked around 2000, and then it started decreasing. And the reason it started decreasing is because the results um, were considerably less than perfect. In fact, uh, there were there were significant issues with um, some of the more traditional ways. Uh, the surgical management of anti-reflux disease. And if you look at some papers, the the numbers of anti-reflux operations were going down um, in the uh, 2000s to about 2013. And part of the reason we, that was happening is because there were a lot of complications after anti-reflux surgery the way um, it had been done more traditionally. Um, if you look at the highlighted uh, sentences, it says laparoscopic fund application is the standard anti-reflux surgery, though its popularity has declined due to concerns regarding rap durability and adverse events. That would be complications. Um, they say that prolonged structural complications can occur in up to 30% of cases. That's just not real good. And so when the option was um, imperfect surgical options versus medical options, such as proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers, people were definitely choosing the medical options. So I'm going to talk a little bit. It's going to get kind of technical in terms of what we're going to mention in terms of the surgical approach to this disease, but I'm going to talk to uh, anybody who's watching, whether it's patients or physicians, kind of like I talked to the patients in my office, and we were talking earlier, and I said, this is a very educated group of patients. They've done their homework. They've been on the internet. They know the options available to them. So when I sit them down, I anticipate that they already know something about how uh, uh, anti-reflux uh, goes. And I, I start by showing them what the normal anatomy looks like. Now, this is a, a picture from Netter's anatomy textbook. It's the esophagus, which is running down the middle of the screen. This is the diaphragm, which is the muscle that separates the chest from the abdomen. And you can see the esophagus travels through an opening in the diaphragm called the esophageal hiatus. That's where the term hiatal hernia comes from. Now, the hiatus is made up of a muscular sling that wraps around the lower esophagus, but you can see some of the esophagus in its normal state continues into the abdomen. That's really, really important, okay? Because the pressure in the abdomen is very different from the pressure in the chest. In the abdomen, we have positive pressure. And you can feel that if you push with your abdomen, like straining, almost like you're you're having a bowel movement, um, you can you can feel the positive pressure in your abdomen. Now the pressure in the chest is exactly the opposite. The chest is like a vacuum. And if you tried to suck liquid through a straw, you know that there's there's a vacuum in your chest. So if you have positive pressure in the abdomen, negative pressure in the chest, everything wants to go this way, positive to negative. The reason it doesn't is because the lower part of the esophagus is in the abdomen and it's pinched off by that positive pressure like a valve. And this angle, this acute angle between the esophagus and the stomach, which we call the angle of his, that's a very important structure in terms of pinching off that valve. Okay, so there's, and then I think I have another picture here. So this is the sling of muscle going around the lower esophagus. So there's three components to this valve. One of them is the intra-abdominal length on the esophagus. The second is the snugness of the sling or the width of the opening in the diaphragm. We call that the, the, um, the valve, the, the width of the valve. And then the third thing is that angle between the esophagus and the stomach. So in order to get a good repair, we want to recreate all three of those structures, the length, the width, and the angle. So now this is what a typical hiatal hernia looks like. So you can see, just like any hernia, it just means that an organ has got displaced from its normal 
domain into a, a domain where it shouldn't be. And so a hiatal hernia, what happens is the stomach herniates towards the head. So it goes above the diaphragm into the lower part of the chest. Now where this valve should be in the abdomen, normally where there's positive pressure that can pinch it off, now it's in the chest where there's negative pressure and there's nothing to oppose the free flow of acid back up the esophagus, okay? So all three of, we have all three of the problems. Remember we talked about length, width, and angle. We have no angle because it's been displaced. We have no length of the esophagus below the diaphragm, it's up in the chest and the opening has stretched, it's gotten wider, so the width is too much. Now, there have been previous attempts to try and fix this surgically. Um, I'll talk about a couple. One is, is something called a Nissen fundoplication, which is a 360 degree wrap. So essentially you take the upper part of the stomach and you pull it around the, um, the lower part of the esophagus. This almost looks like the uh, the uh, face masks that we're asking people to wear out to the grocery store. When you look at it, I mean, what you're doing is you're completely encircling the esophagus. It's almost like a tourniquet. And the reason this is the most common operation is from a surgical standpoint, it's pretty straightforward. It's not very hard to do. You wrap the lower part of the esophagus around, uh, around, the, um, around the, or the, the upper part of the stomach around the esophagus. You put three stitches there. You can see count them, one, two, three stitches. And that's it. Problem is, sometimes that wrap is too tight. It creates what's called dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. It doesn't allow people to belch normally when they when they swallow a lot of gas, and that can make people very uncomfortable. It's called gas bloating, and it doesn't sound like it would be very bad, but uh, patients that have it complain a lot about it. Another uh, technique that was tried is to actually implant a metallic magnetic band around the lower esophagus. Um, th and these little magnets are around, an, they're, they're encircled around a piece of elastic that can stretch. So the theory is, is that um, the, the ring can stretch when food comes down and it's, the, the esophagus can squeeze the food into the stomach, but in its normal state, it's uh, the magnets hold a closure, so so it prevents the reflux. So with TIF, and we're going to talk about the different aspects of it. Um, obviously, getting length on the esophagus and then closing the cruise of the of the hiatus, so you get um, so you can correct the width aspect. Um, but then the fasteners that Dr. Nguyen talked about, recreating that angle. So I can tell you as a surgeon. There's two portions of this operation that I know I can do really, really well. One of them is if the esophagus is herniated above the diaphragm, I can get lots of length on that, you know, get the whole hernia reduced and get lots of length um, on the intra-abdominal esophagus. The second thing I know I can do is I can close the uh, hiatus and make a nice snug closure. I can decrease the width. The one thing that's much more challenging to do is to recreate that angle. And that's where TIF comes in because TIF it can create a very reproducible, uniform kind of uh, recreation of that angle. So everyone's the same, it's like a cookie cutter. Every single one you do is exactly the same with multiple points of fixation. And I wanted to show a little, oh, the, the one thing I wanted to plug is that when I do this, I use the Da Vinci Surgical Robot. So the Da Vinci Surgical Robot offers many advantages that laparoscopic surgery can't. Instead of a four times magnifying camera, it's got a 10 times magnifying camera. It's got two eyes on the camera. So you actually have stereoscopic view. You have depth perception. And the, the little instruments on the, on the robot, which are about the size of a pencil eraser, can move just like a human hand, seven degrees of articulation. So it's like you can do an operation with your hands completely inside the patient's body. And so the, there's improved dexterity, um, improved reach. And so from a technical standpoint, you can do a much more complex and delicate operation. This is a, a video and it's sped up. And this is actually, uh, I keep a library of all the cases I do. This is actually John's case. And so you can see he has a very wide hiatal hernia here. 
This is the esophagus being uh, herniated up above the diaphragm. And where the instrument is dissecting now is on that muscle in the diaphragm called the cruise. And you're starting to see the right cruise here. And you're starting to see the esophagus. This is the left cruise here. You can see that we have very good visualization here. And even as you're watching at home, understand that I have stereoscopic vision. So I actually have depth perception. It's like virtual reality. It's almost like being a cyborg when you're, when you're operating. So what we're doing now is we're freeing up the esophagus from the, from the hiatus. And then we're going to we're going to need to get a lot of length on the esophagus because we talked about three things. We want to get length. We want to decrease the width. And then Dr. Nguyen's got it. So you can see how much length we're getting on the lower esophagus. I have a little rubber drain that I'm using as a retractor to just kind of pull the, the lower esophagus. And there you can see the length of the esophagus. And now we're going to get even more length. We're going to use this special device where we can actually burn the tissue between the esophagus, the connective tissue between the esophagus and where it's stuck. Remember, this is a process that takes years to develop. So there's a lot of connective tissue that's sort of tethering the esophagus in place. Once we have all that length, then we what we want to decrease the width of that opening. And you can see with these robotic instruments, you can sew almost like you sew with your hands. Right now, we're putting some stitches in so we can close that opening. You can see that opening is two or three times as wide as it should be. And we can tie these down so they're very precise. And here I'm going to put three stitches behind the esophagus. And then I put another stitch in front of the esophagus. And what you can see at the end of it is it's a real snug closure around the esophagus. We have plenty of intra-abdominal length. And then Dr. Nguyen can come in and recreate the angle with the TIF procedure. And that's kind of what it looks like when I'm done with the surgical part. That took us about an hour. That whole case took us about an hour. And then Dr. Nguyen came in and did her part. And uh, that's basically it, you know? I mean, I think it's a dynamite procedure. Um, I, think, uh, I think patients have great results and I think John would be able to talk about that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Perlstein and Dr. Nguyen. Um, I, I bet, um, thank you very much to um, a lot of you that are asking questions on Facebook. I do see them come through. Um, we will get to answer some of those questions that we have. Um, so don't, don't worry, but I do want to um, kind of dive a little bit into uh, John's uh, story um, with GERD and how he suffered with GERD and how he actually came in and saw Dr. Nguyen um, and Dr. Pearlstein for his procedure. So John, tell us a little bit about your story. Um, when did you start feeling your GERD symptoms? You know, the first symptoms were about a little over 20 years ago, manifested initially as esophageal spasms. And at first everybody thought of them. And I had all sorts of, you know, tests done and EKGs and, and whatnot. Um, and my heart was fine and I was still having these episodes and then it was, well, you're having panic attacks. You know, you're, you're, it's, you know, too much stress in your life. Right. So, you know, I try to be Zen like and all that. And, you know, I still wasn't getting, you know, still, still having them. And I was, you know, starting to have noticed I was getting more and more heartburn. And then they started noticing, well, we'll start treating you for the heartburn. And uh, it, it didn't make the esophageal spasms go away, but it, helped with the heartburn a little bit. And it got to the point though, where they had to refer me to a specialist for endoscopies. And that was, it took a few years to get to that point. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, I had an endoscopy. I was diagnosed with GERD. Um, I was, on my first one, I was also diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus, um, which was scary. Okay. And yeah. I had yeah. endoscopies for every year, you know, going on for a number of years to the point where um, it got to where I could do them every three years because it was, you know, the progress was, was slowing and it was now just to make sure that everything was in check. But I was still having the spasms and they were getting stronger and more debilitating. I even had one of those motility studies that Dr. Nguyen talked about. Um, uh, and I'll tell you, that is, <laughs> that is about as a medieval procedure as you can have. <laughs> 
it was uh, it was it was tough. It, it was a real tough procedure. But it, you know, everything you know as far as you know, it, you know, came back and it gave us a little bit more information. Um, and uh, you know, when I had my endoscopy last October, uh, as I was meeting with the, the doctor beforehand to schedule it and, and go over you know my progress and what I've been uh, encountering. He said that there were a couple of procedures now that were available. Uh, one was the tip procedure, the other was the links, and that uh, you know after my endoscopy, he would be able to tell me if I was a good candidate for you know for either procedure. Sure. And, and that got me excited. And you know, about a week later, I had my endoscopy, and you know, he told me that I was um, I was a candidate. So I uh, hit the internet and did a lot of research. You know, a lot of you know, a lot of a lot of reading, a lot of studying. You know, as, as most people tend to do, and um, really, you know, felt that the Tiffany. Um, uh, so I, you know, pursued that as the course of action, and you know, got an appointment with Dr. Nguyen, and uh, you know, went over what it was all about, got her views on it. It reinforced my, you know, my decision that I made the right decision. And then uh, that was in November, and then it took us, you know, you have to get approvals, you have to do, you know, uh, tests. I had to go to a cardiac surgeon, you know, surgeon to make sure that, you know, uh, the episodes I was having, you know, were still not, you know, cardiac related. And on uh, January 13th, I, I had my combined procedure. You know, Dr. Uh, Perlstein came in, started off uh, with the... Uh, Da Vinci uh, surgery, and then Dr. Nguyen came in and did the TIFF, and I think, I think it was only just you know over four hours, between four and five hours, you know, from when I went in to you know when they brought me out to the recovery room. Um, have to say, um, well, I have to be careful. I can't say it's the best decision I made in my life because my wife will give, me, give me a hard time. <laughs> it's the health-related decision I ever made in my life. Um, <laughs> You know, there is a very, very strict diet afterwards, and I was I was committed to it. Uh, I didn't want Dr. Perlstein or Dr. Nguyen to yell at me, that's for sure. <laughs> but um, it, it is a, you know, it's a commitment of a diet, you know. Right, um, right. And it takes, you know, six to eight weeks to get through it. Um, and, you know, uh, I got through it. You know, it was, you know, parts of it were, you know, were not fun at all because of what you're, you know, you're, you're living on for the first few days, broth, jello and popsicles. But um, a big plus, you know, is, you know, I lost, uh, you know, just over, you know, 15 pounds, you know, from that, which, you know, um, I could, I could use. <laughs> so, um, but I was very, very happy with the procedure. I'm, I'm, I'm ecstatic with my quality of life now. Um, things that I couldn't have before, I will, I will even uh, take a glass of wine. I haven't been able to have wine in over, you know, somewhere between 12 and 15 years. And I would like to toast both of my doctors, Dr. Perlstein and Dr. Yes. Nguyen. Thank you so much. You know, that's yeah. fantastic. My of life is so much better. I, you know, um, no more spasms, uh, no, no heartburn, um, no regurgitations, no, you know, uh, no refluxes, um, and no and, medications, right? I'm sorry. And no medications and no medications, you know? Um, and, uh, I did have to wean off of them. I, I was told you can't just, you know, stop them cold Turkey, but you know, I, I weaned off of them and, uh, you know, one less, one less pill to take. So, you know, so couldn't be happier. You're completely off of your PPIs, is that correct? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let, me, let me mention one other thing, and there's there's no artificial material in your body. You know what the way you're you were re, yeah. we put you back together. We didn't have to use any mesh. We didn't have to use any implantable devices. There's you know, yeah. it's, it's just yeah. you. Yeah, and it's a big decision point in um, in choosing TIFF because I did not want. Uh, a very invasive, which, you know, a, a Lynx procedure was, was, was the other option. And, you know, that is full blown cut me open type of thing. Did not want that. Um, did not want a foreign, you know, object in me, you know, the, the titanium magnetic beads, um, you know, did not want to deal with this, the, you know, frequency or the potential frequency of the uh, difficulty swallowing 
And comparing, you know, the procedure, the invasiveness and the side effects, TIF was, you know, by and large, you know, just, a, you know, the obvious choice to me at least. And in discussions with Dr. Nguyen and, and others, you know, just got, you know, got reinforced. And I feel, you know, to this day that I made the right decision. Fantastic. Wow. That's a great story. Um, thank you for sharing that with you. Uh, we do have some questions and some of them for, are for the physicians, but some are for you, uh, John, as well. Um, you did mention that you have um, Barrett's and a question that's come up from Julie on Facebook. She's asking, is, is the TIF procedure effective for Barrett's? Um, I'll let you, Dr. Nguyen, maybe answer that question on how that affects um, his Barrett's. Yeah, I think that um, we have the association between GERD and Barrett's. Uh, we always hope that with treatment of the GERD that the Barrett's will either improve or resolve. Uh, some of the prior surgical studies with the Neeson fundification, the thought was that the Barrett's can resolve. Um, I, I don't know that there is uh, enough long-term uh, data for the TIF device in terms of regression of Barrett's. Uh, we have started our own series um, and hoping to publish that pretty soon in the next year to see if, like John, uh, with a short segment or early disease, uh, that the Barrett's will actually improve. That's our hope. Daryl, do you have um, thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I, you know, obviously the, the, the main concern is that is Barrett's can be a precursor to esophageal cancer. And, you know, I mean, the teaching point is that generally speaking, Barrett's may not regress, but it, it may not, if, if you can um, impede the acid reflux, that it won't progress, you know, into dysplasia and eventually esophageal cancer. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, now, uh, John, uh, questions come up, and this is um, actually for you and also um, the doctors. You know, um, what types of um, symptoms did you have? Were they more typical, you know, that heartburn, or did you have more atypical symptoms, um, difficulty, uh, you know, did you have a sore throat all the time, um, or those types of um symptoms. So A, what were your symptoms? And then the next question that has come up from Paul on Facebook is, um, can the TIF help treat LPR? Um, you know, I had the esophageal spasms, you know, and, and they were, you know, they were debilitating. I mean, they were just staggering. And, you know, part of the thing is, is we realized it wasn't a cardiac event was I could drink a little bit of cold water and it would you know, it would bring me some relief. Um, unfortunately, you know, I didn't always have cold water with me when I was out and about and I, you know, encounter spasm and it, it could happen anywhere. I mean, I had them on, you know, plane flights during takeoff. I had them, you know, while I was driving, I had them while I was home watching TV, you know, so they were, you know, they were, uh, there was no consistency to them. Uh, I did start having the, um, regurgitations and you know if I was having frequent regurgitations I would have a sore throat um, I, I learned to identify you know some of my triggers you know wine was you know was almost immediately you know a target um, as I mentioned you know I've mentioned before white wine was much more difficult on me than than red wine but uh, I, I couldn't handle either really but I would immediately feel re uh, white wine you know, the effects of it, uh, when I had it, white, red wine, you know, a couple of hours later and it was not fun. You just completely had to cut it out of, um, you know, of my, of, of my diet, but, um, you know, some sore throats, a lot of heartburn, um, and the spasms. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. Now, Nguyen, you yeah. don't have any chest pain at all. No, no, no more. Spasm. I, I am, Right now, I am symptom free. You know all those things that I had. You know, I I do, I do have one of the beds that's adjustable, so I do I do st still sleep elevated. Um, but I, I, all those symptoms I had before, I have not had any reoccurrence since the surgery, and that's about three and a half months ago. That's great. 
Thank you. Um, Dr. Nguyen and uh, Dr. Perlstein, do you want to talk maybe a little bit about um, TIF or treatment options for LPR? Does it treat LPR? So um, there are uh, the, the typical and the, the atypical symptoms. So LPR, laryngeal pharyngeal reflux. Um, I think definitely I believe that if the patient respond to PPI therapy, um, then likely the patient will respond after therapy. Um, that makes sense. And um, it's a little bit trickier if there was no response to PPI or anti-acid medication prior to therapy, even though you document an abnormal pH study prior to treatment. Um, I, I think that um, when you have uh, studies showing that both the typical and the atypical symptoms improve after therapy, I think that the patient can do well. Um, but it is a little bit trickier if the patients don't respond pre prior to the therapy. Okay, thank you. And there's another question here from Mandy. Uh, if PPIs are not working, will TIF be effective? Um, I, I think that if you have a documented abnormal pH study, if you have esophagitis on endoscopy, if you have Barrett's esophagus, and um, the PPI use, sometimes we don't take it correctly, we don't dose it at the right, um, or you take it with a meal rather than prior to the meal, um, or you just don't get enough PPI, or after many years of PPI use, the effect has worn off. So it may not accurately predict how you respond. Um, but I think that if you have an abnormal pH study and everything else that I suggested and uh, treatment should improve symptoms. Okay, thank you. Uh, so another question is, um, how can you tell if this is a mechanical issue versus not? Um, I, I'd like to elaborate a little bit on that, and um, at the time of endoscopy, you can actually evaluate and look at the anatomy in addition to our esophagogram, but at the time of endoscopy, you can actually see if you dedicate enough time, how long and the length of the hernia as well as the width of the hernia. Um, if we do the typical endoscopy and very quick about it, you can sometimes not see the hernia at its true state. And as it is dynamic, if you look quickly, you may not see it. And we often uh, undercall the presence of a, a hernia. Uh, when endoscopy, um, at the time of endoscopy, if we see a small hernia, uh, when Dr. Perlstein goes in, he actually sees uh, a bigger hernia than what we are able to predict the time of endoscopy. Yeah, I mean, when I watched the the last TIFF talk with a couple other doctors, Dr. Chang, Dr. Nguyen, and and they were talking about how when um, when you retroflex the scope, when you look back up at the at the GE junction when you're doing endoscopy, that they talk about being very patient and waiting up to a minute to 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 really see the width of that opening. If you just take a quick look, just a second, a lot of times you don't appreciate that there is a significant opening there, and uh, Consistent with a lot of uh, published data, we have found anecdotally, just our series, that um, some of the preoperative studies tend to undercall or underestimate the both the length and the width of the hernia. Right, right. So thank you for that, both of you. Um, now, let me just make sure, did they already discuss PPI medications? You did. Um, there is a question, what studies do you need prior to the TIF procedure? Maybe, uh, Dr. Nguyen, you could talk about those. I, I know you mentioned in your presentation, but just mention them maybe again, those different sure. studies. Sure. Um, the first, we talked about endoscopy to look for complications of GERD and looking for Barrett's esophagus, looking at the anatomy, looking for a hiatal hernia. So that kind of information is found at the time of endoscopy. Now we have technology called endoflip. So the endoflip uh, uh, device can be done to look at esophageal motility at the time of endoscopy and that can bypass that esophageal motility uh, study that John really thought it was barbaric. Uh, 
I apologize for that. And um, it can be uncomfortable because the traditional esophageal motility study is done with a probe inside the nose and the patients don't like it and they remember it and they talk about it. <laughs> um, but with EndoFlip, uh, our newer technology now, we can do the esophageal motility testing at the time of endoscopy. Um, and also that pH study um, is uh, helpful. It's helpful for us to document uh, prior to treatment so that we can follow the patient post-therapy to have something more objective to look at to see that the patient improved. Um, and also the insurance will um, look at that to say, you know, to um, approve the device that the patient truly has GERD. Okay. Thank you. So one of the big questions, um, as we all know, we're, we're in this pandemic and this unusual circumstance right now. And um, a lot of people have questions about, um, you know, can I go see my physician? Can I get have an initial consult with them before I even come in? Um, and also then, you know, is it safe for me to have an electric uh, le elective procedure? Excuse me. Um, are there things or, or things that you're doing at your uh, hospital or what are, what are the things that you're doing? Are you offering telehealth right now for patients that are suffering with GERD? Yeah, most physicians are, you know, I mean, we've really switched over to telemedicine, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I tell m my patients, which is um, right now, uh, perhaps the safest place you can be at least where we are, which is Orange County, is this hospital. I mean, it's just, they clean it multiple times a day. Um, the patients that are sick are com kept completely separate from the physicians. We've had, to my knowledge, zero um, events where uh, COVID patients have um, infected a healthcare provider or another patient. Um, and, uh, you know, I can only speak for my hospital, but I know that most hospitals are really doing a very good job of trying to keep all the patients safe. And now we're opening things up for elective surgery again. Okay. So with the telehealth, I hope this will go into the future as uh, as well as uh, this time period. Hopefully it will continue that we're able to do the video conferencing with patient and uh, continue on. In terms of safety, um, I think as we go into that more elective uh, time when we're able to do elective procedures, patients will be tested um, and we should uh, get the result before we have an endoscopy. So I think that's going to flow into the next week or so where we do testing uh, prior to a procedure. Okay. So we're very safe and very right. clean and we have all the PPEs that we have uh, that we need. Perfect. That sounds great. So uh, last question. There's a couple of other questions, but I, I um, just want to touch on, um, you know, a lot of these patients right now are um, very stressed, you know, because they're, you know, whether they're staying at home or having to homeschool their kids. And I'm hearing a lot of people having flare ups and having a lot more um, GERD symptoms. Um, what do you suggest um, that they do in the interim before they can come in and see you to help reduce their um, their symptoms that they're having? I think stress will make the symptom feel worse, but I don't think that it causes the GERD. And I've heard uh, stories the other way too, that, oh my gosh, I'm home now and I have no GERD symptoms at all <laughs> because, you know, it's a very controlled environment. And when I uh, the patients worked, they had worsening uh, of their symptoms. So um, I think uh, if we can de-stress, um, that'll always be helpful for any kind of medical condition. Sure. Thank you very much. Well, we're almost at the top of the hour and um, I can't thank you um, all again enough for uh, sharing your story, uh, John, and then, you know, your expertise positions um, on the TIF procedure and the hiatal hernia. Um, are there any last thoughts or anything that you'd like to add before we conclude tonight? No, thank you so much, John. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for letting me share my story. It, you know, like I say, I uh, I, I, wanted, I wanted to share this, I, you know, uh, because you know, 
I, I can't say enough on how life changing the procedure was and the quality of life I've, I've had, you know, since that procedure. So, um, I was actually looking forward to, you know, taking part in this, in this talk because I thought it was something, you know, to, for somebody to hear who went through it and, you know, the effect it had, you know, what, what they went through before and the effect they had on them since they had the procedure. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, well, we, I, would, I would advise people, you know, people that are watching at home to, to do their homework. Um, this is a newer procedure, um, but it's but it's a terrific procedure and the results are, are, are really um, unmatched uh, for this particular problem. Fantastic. Well, thank you again for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. And um, if anybody on here is watching and is wanting to find a physician in their area, they can visit GERDHelp.com. That's www.GERDHelp. As a physician finder, they, you can click um, your state or put in your zip code and find a physician in your area that offers the tip procedure. So thank you again, uh, everybody, and have a wonderful night. We will have another TIFF Talk every Tuesday, so TIFF Talk Tuesday. So hope you can join us uh, next time. And thanks again, everybody. Have a great evening.